Praise the Lord. We're going to jump right into God's Word today. Uh, we are studying out of a passage that the Lord gave us when we started the year uh, in Jeremiah chapter 15 and also in Psalm, uh, Psalms 34. And the Word of God has a lot to say about what we say, about our speech, the things that come out of our mouth. And uh, God has promised that if we will watch our words and put the right things in our mouth and take the wrong things out of our mouth, that God will use our words to build the life and the blessing that he wants us to experience. But if we fail to deal with the words that come out of our mouth that are hurtful to us and others, uh, no matter how many good things we speak, the negative that comes out of our mouth will counter, will counter affect us, will, will basically uh, render null and void any positive things that come out of our mouth. So we need to be very aware. Our words have an impact. Not only does the Bible say this, but we know this now from psychology, neurology, we've shared a lot of these things with you, that words actually frame your mind, they can actually build your brain, and they can tear down negative thought patterns, and they can rebuild good ones. Uh, words have a psychological, they have a neurological, words have a spiritual and metaphysical impact. The Bible tells us that both angels and demons respond to the words of our mouth, and those words, when they're spoken out of the meditations or the thoughts of our heart, they have a powerful impact spiritually on us and on the world we live in. And as Pastor Lee so beautifully shared from the book of Proverbs, life and death is in the power of your tongue. Just point to your mouth and say, life or death? Life or death. My, life. my life. Death in my life. In my life. Comes out of my mouth. So let's fill our mouth with the right things, take the wrong things out. Now we've been talking about things not to say, and uh, the scripture said in Psalm 34, if you want to live a life that's long and prosperous, keep your tongue from these things. So the first step is to keep these things out of your mouth. We've talked about different kinds of things we need to stop saying, complaining, criticism and mockery of others, lying and deception, cursing and filthy language. And then we talked two weeks ago about angry words, not angry birds, angry words. When we are in, in, in anger and we speak out of that anger, especially yelling, screaming, contentious, speaking in the the passion of a strong, angry moment is actually destructive, not only to others, in almost every case, it's very hurtful to us, to our brain, and to our own neurobiology. And uh, we need to know how to deal with anger. In fact, I'm going to, I have a part two to that message that I'm just going to record and put online so you can watch it about the way that you can deal with anger because anger is, ne 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 is not necessarily an angry emotion or a bad emotion, but it's an emotion that can really impact us and others in a negative way if we don't manage it or process it in a healthy way. So I'll, I'll talk about that and we'll put that online. But today, I want to finish looking at things not to say uh, in categories because we're going to move next week, which is the first Sunday of March. We're going to begin talking about what we should speak and the things that we need to put in our mouth. And we're going to talk about faith and how to use our words to build the world that we want to live in. Praise the Lord. And so I want to focus on this. So we're going to jump right into the last area that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to me about to talk to you about. And uh, and I just want to say to you that this morning, if as I go through this and talk about these things, uh, you find that it's a little close to home, that some of the things that I'm saying uh, might feel, uh, uh, you know, uh, a little bit like a flashlight's being uh, sh shined on you. Uh, don't feel too bad because we're all in the same place. Just keep looking forward and saying amen and no one will know it's you. <laughs> but the moment you think it's not you, I promise you, it is you. So we're all in the same place this morning, and I did say us, we, right? <laughs> so we have to learn to deal with this. Now today I'm going to talk to you about one of the most destructive and most hurtful things we can do with our mouths. This is so bad that God has spoken about it from the Old Testament all the way through to the New, and God actually lists this as one of the seven particular sins that he hates, despises, and abhors. You know, God hates sin because of what it does to us and what it does to humans whom he loves. That's why sin is sinful, because it's destructive. But there's some sins he hates even worse than others because they have a particularly damaging effect on other people. And it's really interesting when God lists the seven things he hates, uh, that those seven things, uh, four out of seven of them have to do with your mouth, and none of them have to do what you do with what you do with your private parts. Can we talk this morning? Yeah. 
I'm not saying that God doesn't tell us we should behave well when it comes to our morality and sexuality. We should, absolutely. But often we take certain kinds of sins, maybe the more sinful, more the more shameful sins, and we put them on the high list of the worst. But when God talks about seven things he really hates, he, he, he talks about things that have to do with attitudes of the heart and words that we speak that are hurtful towards other people. Not that God wants us to sin in other ways, uh, and he doesn't care about those things, but the things that really hurt God, the things that really, really upset God is when we use our words and our mouth to hurt other people. And so we're going to take a look at this. I want to talk to you today about slander, gossip, tail-bearing, and breaking confidences. Have you ever had anybody tell a secret that you told them? Have you ever told a secret that someone told you? You don't have to say anything. I know you have. Have you ever gotten a secret delight when somebody comes and tells you something that's negative about someone that isn't present? Have you ever kind of, you know, just wanted to share a little bit of juicy information that really just, you know something no one else knows and you just got to tell somebody and it's just, and often we justify these things in so many different ways. And we're going to talk about how, how our justifications are actually uh, not, are just excuses. They're not, in God's eyes, good reason. And how we've got to get these things out of our mouth and why. Now, now I just want you to notice, uh, as we begin this today, I want to say, we all like a good story, every one of us. We all like to hear something uh, that has to do with someone outside of ourselves or a situation, whether it's a, it's a fictional or a real story, uh, that tells, tells uh, something that's dramatic and interesting. And good stories have certain characteristics. They tend to have a, a struggle, a challenge that you empathize with. Then they tend to have a, an opportunity or a moment where change occurs. And then as things begin to get better, there's something that happens that's a test of the change. And it looks like it's going to fall apart. And at the end of a good story, there's a resolution. Whether the person learns or doesn't learn from it, there's something that happens that, that reveals something that keeps our interest. And every great story has a lot of these characteristics in them. And so all of us, we're all in essence a story being written. We all have stories. Uh, uh, and when I say stories, I'm not talking about fictional things. I'm talking about events and, and the narrative of the way life is played out. There are stories we tell ourselves. There's, uh, there's stories we tell other people. And uh, we're really invested today in our culture and really around the world of creating a story about our life. And we put it up on something called the internet. And those stories are called uh, our Facebook pages, our Instagram pages, our Snapchat page, Snap chat pages, uh, Twitter, whatever, uh, whatever the latest social media would be. TikTok, I heard something about something TikTok. So, uh, but, but we create these stories, we put them up there because we want to tell the best story of ourselves. And the reality is stories can be very powerful, they can be very inspirational, and stories uh, can also be very, uh, very, uh, in, uh, let's just say informational. They can advise us, they can help us. But there are some things that are stories that, whether they're true or not, they're not ours to repeat. And that's when it comes to stories that involve other people, their pain, their secrecies, things that have to do with their struggles and their, their problems that, uh, that it is not yours to repeat or to share. And uh, we've got to be very careful about telling stories if it involves the mistakes, failures, and suffering of someone else who is currently alive who would rather you didn't talk about it. I'm going to say that again. We've got to be very careful about repeating stories that involve the mistakes, failures, and suffering of someone else, not present, who is alive and would really prefer you didn't repeat it. And not only that, God hates it when we repeat the mistakes, failures, and sins of other people for the purpose of trying to do something to make ourselves look or feel better. Repeating words that tear down others not only impacts our ability to really come to a place where we can live the life we want to live because we're, we're really often doing it because we're measuring ourselves by someone else and we're feeling insecure. So we're repeating a story that tears someone else down so we can somehow meal feel better or more secure about ourselves, and we're finding our security in something that isn't really how we should find our security. We need to find our security in the love of God for us, regardless of what's going on in life. 
But the reality is, when we repeat things that we shouldn't repeat or, or tell things that aren't ours to tell about someone else that isn't present, that is hurtful, negative, or reveals their nakedness or sin, we actually impact our ability to go into the deeper places of God. Listen to Psalm 15. It's a very brief psalm, but it starts with a question. Who may worship in your sanctuary, O Lord? Who may enter your presence on your holy hill? This is a reference to those who really are invited into the place where God fellowships, the deeper places of God. Who is able to go and really fellowship with God in that intimate place of his presence? Here's the answer. Those who lead lead blameless lives and do what's right, speaking the truth with sincere hearts. And then he qualifies it, those who refuse to gossip or harm their neighbors or speak evil of their friends. To say it again, those who refuse to gossip, harm their neighbors, or speak evil of their friends. These are the people that can go deeply into the presence of God. Now, when we think about this, God is particularly sensitive to the words that we speak as it relates to other people. And God speaks about this a lot in his word. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and if you have a Bible, you can navigate to this. I want you to notice this. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 20, Paul is writing to a church that he had founded, and he's sending this letter in advance of him coming to be with them. He was actually coming to see them, and he was coming also to correct some issues in the church. He was coming to receive a special offering that they had promised to, to, uh, to give for a, a particular need that he was going to meet in Jerusalem. And so Paul is writing this letter in preparation. And there were some problems in the church, and Paul is saying, listen, I really wanna come and have a good time with you, but based on the things that I'm hearing, we're gonna have to have a different kind of conversation. And in verse uh, 20 of uh, 2 Corinthians 12, Paul said that I fear that when I come, I will not find you as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as you don't wish. In other words, I'm afraid that when I come, I'm going to find you guys acting in ways that I really wish you weren't acting in. And by the way, if that's the case, when I come... I'm going to be in a particular attitude, mood, and behavior pattern that you're going to wish was different because I'm going to deal with it. Now, this is important. Church is a place where we should come to be encouraged, built up, loved, edified. We should receive hope, right? That is important. But I want to get this over to you. Part of the mission of the church and of the pastor of the church is not just to speak things that are encouraging and hopeful, but at the same time to speak things that are corrective, that are incisive, that help us to recognize the behavior patterns in our lives that are hurting us and other people. Paul said, you know, that the word of God is profitable for doctrine, right, for instruction, for reproof and correction. It helps us, but it also corrects us. It teaches us what we need to do differently. We live in a world today where nobody wants to have anybody tell them that what they're doing isn't the best, isn't right. Uh, My truth is my truth. Your truth is your truth. You can share your truth and maybe I'll receive it. We have lost the capacity as a culture, by and large, to have someone uh, share with us in a very straightforward way that what we're doing is hurtful or dangerous. We don't want anybody to tell us anything. And our, our, our loss of capacity to receive correction is not a good thing in our culture. Uh, the fact that we get highly offended if somebody says something that, that maybe uh, uh, is in any way negative towards us, uh, we need to be, uh, as Christians, we need to develop a different kind, a set of, uh, we need to be secure in who we are, and if somebody shares something with us that's corrective, we need to be secure enough to be able to take the good part and not let it destroy us or devastate us and fall into a shame spiral, okay? But sometimes we've gone so far the other way, trying to be so encouraging and always build people up, that we don't really speak the hard things that people need to hear to grow. You've got to have some hard things. There's some things you've got to feed on that are positive, and there's some things you've got to get rid of that are negative. That's why your house has a kitchen and a bathroom. If you live in a kitchen and you never use the bathroom, we're going to have a problem. Because you will go to the bathroom, but in the wrong room. And then no one's going to want to eat anything. I wasn't planning to use this illustration, but just 
I think we'll just get out of that right now. Just turn to somebody and say, I got a kitchen and a bathroom. Things I need to put in me, things I need to get out of me. Okay. So Paul said, you don't want to find, you, I don't want to be found you such as you don't wish. He said, lest there be, notice, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, these yelling fits and, 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 and angry outbursts, selfish ambitions. Notice these next two words, backbitings, whisperings, conceits and tumults, or basically uh, little fights. In the New Living Translation, he said it this way. He said, I'm afraid that when I come, I won't like what I find. And you won't like my response. I'm afraid that I will, be fi- I will find quarreling, jealousy, anger, selfishness, notice, slander, and gossip. I'm going to look at these two words, slander and gossip. This word slander is the word katalalia. And it just, just real quick, it comes from two Greek words, uh, lalea or la- laleo, means to speak something. It, it actually can be translated the tongue, to speak. Kata is the, is the prefix for against, to be against. So it's really to speak against, to use your mouth to say something that is hurtful to someone else. When you put it together, it means to intentionally say something with the purpose of hurting or tearing down someone else. And it's not the same as the second word. The second word is is translated gossip, and this is, a, this is a very interesting word. It's only found twice in the New Testament, and it's really a word from the Greek world that was used to describe something very interesting, and it's the word setherimos, or rismos, and it means to secretly whisper behind someone's back, or to whisper something in order to put them into a spell. It was used to describe magicians and street performers in the ancient world who would whisper to deadly snakes. They would speak to snakes and charm them and get them under their control. It was actually a word that was used in reference to sorcery, witchcraft, and magicians who would, who would use their words to, to begin to almost, although this, the full concept didn't come till later, it really is hypnotize, get somebody into your spell so that you can control them by whispering. You know, whispering is an interesting thing. Everybody say whispering. In fact, sometimes the word for gossip is translated whispering or whisperer. When you whisper, you're actually trying to get the attention of somebody while avoiding the attention of others. And when we whisper, in fact, just turn to somebody next to you and just say, I'm whispering right now. Just go ahead. I'm whispering. Listen to how it sounds. Do it again. I'm whispering right now. How are you doing? Right? It actually has a little bit of a shh, a little sound to it, but you can't tell what's being said. When we whisper, we're intentionally lowering our voice, getting close to the ear of one person because we want them to get some information that we don't want others to know we're saying. So there's something about whispering. Now, there's a time to whisper when it's good, healthy communication or helping somebody out. But this idea of whispering is in this word that we find here in the Greek, and it means to secretly repeat something about someone not present, to tell a story in secret, and to tell it in a way that the person it involves doesn't know about it or doesn't hear about it. So there's a, it's sort of like, like you're saying something you shouldn't be saying, so you're lowering your voice because you're wanting them to get some information that you wouldn't say out loud to other people. And so it's not used in a positive context here. And the Bible says that slander, gossip, and there's another form of of this that is really important. Let's put it in three categories. Slander, gossip, and then breaking confidences or telling secrets. All of these things are a little bit different, but they're all damaging and hurtful according to the word of God. Now listen to what God says about slander. Let's take the first word, slander, katalelo. In Psalm 101 and verse 5, The Bible says, whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. Slanders his neighbor. Everybody say slander. That means you're intentionally saying something 
to tear down someone else that isn't present. Proverbs 11.9, listen to this. Proverbs 11.9, and I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation. It says, by their words, the godless destroy their friends, but knowledge will rescue the righteous. Verse 11 says, upright citizens are good for a city and make it prosper, but the talk of the wicked tears it apart. Do you know communities, cities, villages, and towns can be torn apart because of slander campaigns, whispering campaigns, people that just take a, 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 a series of facts that may or may not be completely accurate, but they're not the total picture. And then you create the worst possible picture of what that means and interpret it, and then you tell it to somebody else in a way that will incite them against that person. You can just call this um, anything that you watch on your television this year between television programs that is of a political nature. The vast majority, and here's what's amazing. When, when politicians, even politicians who want to do the right thing, they want to run a good, clean campaign. They want, to, they want to point out what their vision is, which I always feel like I'd rather hear your vision than hear your interpretation of someone else's mistakes. But the reality is, unfortunately, in our culture... Uh, sin sells, and, and when you hear negative things about someone else, it motivates you against that person. And so in political maneuvering, it's not just enough to get people to vote for you. What they found to be very effective is to get people to be afraid of someone else. And so what's always really fascinating about so many of these things is these ads, whether they're political ads or, or ads promoting something that are negative, their goal is to create a negative feeling in you about someone else by taking perhaps facts, but often, maybe two-thirds of the time, if you fact check it, you'll find that, that it's not the total picture. There's more information that will kind of cause it to come into a different light. But you take the worst possible moments of somebody, you spin it with a, this must mean this, and you put it out there. And, and what happens is it causes people to be afraid, and then uh, you manipulate the, the populace uh, that way. And, uh, and it's, here's what I want to say. Negative facts are facts, and, 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 and it, there are times when we need to be aware of things, obviously, that aren't right. But there's something about our culture that feeds on the worst possible interpretation of something. And we've got to be very careful as believers that we don't jump in on slander. You know, one of the names for Satan is accuser. In fact, Satan means accuser. Everybody say accuser. One translation is slanderer. Satan loves to slander, to speak against, to accuse. He's called the accuser of the believer or the brethren who accuses us before God day and night. Satan doesn't go to God with things that aren't facts because God knows the truth. But Satan takes the worst possible interpretation of all of our sins and failures and he spins it in such a way as an accuser that makes us look as in the worst possible light to God. He's always calling for our judgment, for our destruction. And the Bible says Satan, his main job is to accuse us before God day and night. He's constantly telling God, look how they did this wrong. They did that wrong. How can you forgive them? How can you bless them? It's not right. It's not fair. Thank God that we have more than a prosecuting attorney who's taking the worst moments of our life and presenting them to God in the worst possible light. We've got a defense attorney. And the Bible actually says that not only does Satan stand as, in a, a, as a prosecuting attorney before God, but that Jesus is our defense attorney. He's our advocate. He's the one that always argues for mercy, grace, forgiveness, healing, and deliverance. He speaks on our behalf. Because we sin, we have an advocate with God the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's always there to say, yes, fa yes, Father, they did this. They may have done that, but, but, Father, I died for that. My blood was shed for that. They put that under my blood, so it's been forgiven. It's been covered. It's been paid for. Aren't you glad you've got an advocate with God who's arguing on your behalf? Now, my question is this. When it comes to one another, are you going to be a Satan or a Jesus? 
Are you going to try to create the worst possible picture of the people you're jealous of, the people you'd like to see fall, the people that you've heard negative things about, and repeat those to others? Or are you going to be the person that's going to create the best possible picture, not lying, but advocating for one another? You know, we're supposed to be advocates. We're supposed to, I want to do the work of Jesus. I want to be able to believe for the very best. And if God allows me, this is important, if God allows you to know something unsavory or negative about another person, it's not so that you can talk about them. It's so that you can pray for them. It's so you can be a part of helping them. And sometimes you just need to say, it's none of my business. What if everybody had a camera on you and could see everything you did 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not only outside, but they had a camera recording every thought in your head. And it was displayed on a screen, and everyone could see it. How, would you enjoy that? Well, I ain't got nothing to hide. You liar. Yes, you do. You got a lot of stuff you don't want people to know. And sometimes the self-righteous people, the people who, who, who feel the, you know, I, I don't have, people who claim they have no sin, sometimes they've got the worst sin going on in the world, which is pride and judgment of other people. Mm. Come on. We've got to be really careful in this matter of judgment. Because the only one that can hold all the negative about us and keep the right mat- attitude is God. Amen? So we've got to be really careful about what tack we're going to take when it comes to other people. And the Bible says we're not supposed to slander. Uh, listen to, uh, well, it says in verse 12 of Proverbs 11, it is foolish to belittle one's neighbor. A sensible person keeps quiet. Turn to somebody and say, there's a time just you don't have to say anything. I, just, I, I, don't, I don't have any opinion on that. Or I've got an opinion, but it's not going to be beneficial for me to say it. Now, the second thing he talks about slander, the second word is tail-bearing, which I've told you about the Greek for this word, and it means to take a story and to bring it to someone else. And tail-bearing in this context means taking a negative kind of salacious story and repeating it to someone who isn't present. And listen to what the Bible says in Leviticus 19.16, you shall not go about as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You're not supposed to be telling stories about your neighbor. So, well, you, you know what I saw the other day? You know what I heard? Well, whatever you saw and heard, if they would prefer that you didn't reveal it to someone else, I'm not talking about breaking the law, things that are gonna endanger others. I'm talking about, you know, how many know you, you, your neighbors live next to you? Sometimes they're going to have stuff, right? And, and if you go and tell other people about it and repeat it, you're not, you're not resolving it. Proverbs 18.8, 8, the words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles. They go down into the innermost parts of the body. In the Hebrew, it says in the belly. They're just, ooh, I got to tell you something. This is so amazing. I can believe this. You know what? You know what I heard? Or did you hear about? And then they'll tell you something that they heard about. And sometimes we think, well, it's not just a person they know. Listen, we live in a world where we're constantly hearing things about these, these folks called celebrities. We're constantly hearing things about politicians. We're constantly hearing rumors all around us all the time. And you know, we gotta make a decision. Is it my job to repeat every negative thing? Or is it my job to just say, okay, well, you know, that may be true, but I'm not going to live in that. I'm not going to spread that. What, it, it, does no, it does no good. And, and there's the part of us that loves to hear negative things about other people is partially because we're insecure and knowing that someone else that maybe we feel uh, intimidated by, maybe a little jealous of, or we don't like because there's something about them that irritates something deficient in us, when we hear something negative, it helps us to, you know, they come down a little bit and somehow we feel better. But I'm going to tell you something. Putting someone else's light out does not make your light grow brighter. I'm going to say that again. 
Putting out someone else's light doesn't make your light any brighter. Proverbs 26, 20 said, where there's no wood, the fire goes out. And where there's no tailbearer, strife ceases. A lot of times, the reason people are always in a, the relationships, friendships, they're always you know, not getting along, there's, there's usually one person that's stirring things up. It's that third person in the friend group. Yeah. It's the one who's, you know, really pretty much jealous. And so they don't like the fact that the other two friends may feel close, so they're going to constantly try to plant things. That the other two friends, it kind of caused them to doubt each other, and they get some kind of secret thrill out of it. Uh, Proverbs 16, 28 says, A perverse person sows strife, and a whisperer separates the best of friends. Sometimes friendships have gone to the toilet, not because you actually tried to resolve an issue with someone that you was a friend in a healthy way, but because someone else got in the middle of it and you both are assuming things and hearing things about the other person in the worst possible light, and it was really the tailbearer that separated you. If that tailbearer wasn't present, you probably or could have resolved it in a healthy way. The Bible has a lot to say about not making a light or even mocking people who you don't know and who are famous, especially authority figures. Ecclesiastes 10.20 said, Never make light of a king, even in your thoughts, and don't make fun of the powerful, even in your own bedroom. For a little bird might deliver your message and tell them what you said. Oh, I've got stories about this. It's so easy to just throw in your voice onto something and you have no idea how it gets back to people. Oh, yeah. And I'm telling you, I don't have time to tell you some good stories. Oh, my, my. Okay, I'll tell you one. One time, I'll tell on somebody else. Uh, one time, I was... Uh, with a friend, and uh, we were at a restaurant, and, uh, and the restaurant was across the street from another restaurant that was owned by a politician in the community. And so uh, my friend was telling me, did you hear about this politician? I said, no. He said, well, I guess that they were having, a, they were having some brawls and things happening at their restaurant and at the bar, and then and then they came in and threw their weight around, just told a story about this particular politician and how this politician had used, you know, kind of used their weight to, uh, to deal with something with the police department. And at any rate, you know, it was gossip and maybe it was true. But uh, as, as this person was telling, I was thinking, wow, what a story, man. <laughs> All of a sudden I noticed that over the shoulder of my friend, somebody was staring. Now, we were at a restaurant, and there's people around you, but you know, you tend to forget that. And I looked up, and right over my friend's shoulder was the politician. <laughs> now, what makes this even more difficult is that this politician, I, I, had, I was a, a pastoral staff of a local church, and we had invited this politician to come on a particular Sunday in which we honored authority figures, and I was the associate pastor, and I'd met him, and here I am listening to this really salacious story, and this person is just sitting here looking. And so my friend keeps talking. And I just started saying, mm -mm. And my friend said, what, what? He's, he's not here, is he? Is he right there? I said, yeah. He said, oh no. And so since the politician was right over his shoulder, I said, hello, and I greeted him. My friend turned around and said, oh, hi. <laughs> and he made it very clear that he'd heard everything. Now, here's the point. That politician went on to become an even bigger politician. And I was fortunate to have some opportunities to work with this politician. I'd be very ambiguous for a reason, to have an opportunity to work with this particular politician for a number of years. But I often remember that moment and thought to myself, even though I wasn't the one telling the story, I was listening to it. Turn to somebody and say, it's not just what you say, it's what you listen to. 
Proverbs 20:19 says, he who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets. Therefore, don't associate with one who flatters with his lips. In other words, somebody that's always telling you wonderful things, you know, they're probably, if they're always saying great things about you but not so great things about others, remember, if they tell somebody else's story, they're going to tell your story. Amen. And he said, don't associate. You can't have close relationships with people who love to gossip and walk in kingdom life. Proverbs 17.4, it says, evildoers eagerly listen to gossip. Liars pay close attention to slander. Why? Because liars love to hear the worst, and, and even if it's not true, they love to slander. They love to put other people down. What part of us enjoy listening to gossip? What's the part of us that feels good when we hear something that's not good? The Bible goes on to say, those who rejoice at the misfortune of others will be punished. So there's gossip, there's slander, and then the third thing, and I'll just give it to you quick, is um, breaking confidence. Proverbs 11:13 says, a talebearer reveals secrets, but he who is a faithful spirit conceals a matter. Not cover up, but covering somebody up, covering their nakedness. A gossip goes around telling secrets, but those who are untrustworthy, are, and those who are trustworthy can keep a confidence. You see, when someone tells you something and they say to you, please don't tell anyone else, and you go and tell your sister or your mother or your best friend in the guise of a prayer request, you are guilty of breaking a confidence. So I just couldn't, I've, listen, they say that everybody tells somebody something. And, but if you're going to hear somebody's stuff, and they're going to share something with you privately, and you say, I'm not going to tell, you shouldn't tell. Or don't give your word that you won't tell. If somebody starts to tell you something, and you realize, I might need to share this with somebody, you know, uh, then just say, listen, before you say anything else, I feel like this is something, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you this. I think husbands and wives should do this too. My wife and I are both ministers, and so we have something called clergy penitent responsibilities, which means if somebody shares something with us in a private counseling session or in our capacity as a minister and it's of a confidential nature, clearly saying that it's confidential, we are bound, and it's illegal for us to repeat it, including to our spouse. And we honor that. There's things that she ministers to people about she doesn't tell me. And she'll tell them, say, how did they go with so-and-so? They say, well, it went well. I said, something going on with them? She'll say, yeah. I'll say, okay. Can't talk about it? She says, nope. I said, okay. And, and we both have that with each other. There are times that, um, that someone can share something with you and they think that it's confidential, but they didn't say it's confidential. So you need to be clear, if they're telling you something of a private nature that's a, a, a mistake or an error in their life, you can say, now can I share this with someone else? Is it okay if I tell my spouse about this? Is this something that, we, that I can share? I would love to get some people to pray about this. Is that okay? Get their buy-in. They may say, no, I don't want you to tell anybody. Okay, I won't. Or if they start sharing something with you and you feel compelled and you realize it's of a confidential nature, and you don't feel like you're going to be able to hold that with integrity, you need to say to them, listen, don't say another word. I, I don't feel comfortable knowing this. I love you. I'm going to pray for you, but I don't feel this is something that I should have. I, I need to know because I'm, not, I'm, going to, I'm, not, I'm going to feel in a difficult place in the event that I need to share this to protect someone else. Sometimes people have come to me and shared something. How many of you ever had somebody come to you and say, listen, uh, you know, a lot of people... Whenever anybody starts with, you know, there's a lot of people that are upset with you. There's a lot of people who think this about you. And then you're like, who? And they say, well, I can't tell. But I say, well, if you can't tell, then I can't listen. Because I don't want to hear something that's based on the hearsay of your interpretation of what somebody else might or might not have said. I said, you get their permission to talk to me or tell them to talk to me. If they're not going to talk to me, I don't really care to hear it. Why? Because it's, it's fruitless to hear, because you'll build in your mind conspiracies, and people will always heighten things or spin things, even if their hearts are right, they're sometimes not going to give you the full perspective. Turn to somebody and say, breaking confidences. All right. So, just a couple of questions to consider before you repeat something. Here's one. 
Is it negative information, what I'm about to say, is it negative information about someone who isn't present? If it's negative and it's about someone not there, should I, by the way, not just say it, should I share it? Should I click on it? Should I repost it? Should I privately inbox it? Would you share it if the person involved were present? If that person you're about to talk about was here, would you say it? Would you want them to know you're saying it to this person? If not, uh, you probably ought to think deeply about it. Here's another one. Did I say I wouldn't tell anyone? If you said you wouldn't tell anyone, then you need to not tell anyone unless you go, unless they've already found out someone else talked about it, or uh, you go back and say, listen, I want to share this, do you mind? You get their permission. Uh, another question, uh, is it mine to tell? Is this about me? Is this something that involves me? Is it really my story? Is this something I should be sharing? And right along with that, is it my place to tell it? Is it my place to talk about such and such a minister who, who, who struggles with this or fell into this or a church is dealing with a problem? Is it my place to talk about someone else's stuff? Why, am I, why, why do I want to talk about this? You know, is it really my place to share this? If it's not my place, I'm not going to say anything. Here's another question. Will sharing this improve the situation? If I share this with someone else, does it, will it actually make the problem better? If it does an improvement, prove it or, or resolve it, contribute towards a, a better outcome, why are you sharing it? Will sharing it protect someone who is innocent? Now, sometimes you know information that's not good about someone else, and, and because you know it, you have a responsibility to protect someone. And so there's times you need to share something but your heart is to protect someone, not just to tear someone else down. Does that make sense? Uh, here's another one. Uh, would I want someone else to share something like this about me? If someone else knew something about me that I'd done wrong, would I want, or, or, or an unfortunate event, or something, something I went through, would I want someone else to be talking about it? If I'd prefer they didn't, then why am I doing it? Here's another question. Why do I really want to share this? What is the real reason I want to talk about it? Is it because, because I really want to help them? Sometimes we do need to talk to some other people to get some advice on how we can help someone that we know something about. That's an elder, a mentor, a confidant, and as long as you, you don't know it but as a result of a confidence, sometimes you cannot give the name and just say there's a situation and I really need some advice on how I should respond to this situation. Does that make sense? So, so sometimes we need to get some coaching and some help, but we need to be very careful in what we say and the specifics that we share. We need to have some fear of the Lord about it. Because most of the time when God allows us to know something negative about someone else, it's not so that we can create a negative image of that person in someone else's mind. It's so that we can pray for them and try to help them. Amen? So, uh, what is the real reason I want to share, and is it going to improve the situation in any way? And here's, finally, what would happen if I just shut up? What would happen if I just didn't talk about it? You know, would, would it, if I didn't say anything, would it be the end of the world? Can, can you be in a conversation with somebody and they bring up somebody that maybe you don't like, and I'm going to say, not just a friend, somebody you don't know, a celebrity, a politician. And you have to put your opinion on every situation and every person, especially if it's negative and adverse. Now, there's a time to talk about public figures, about their public policies, what's happening in their lives. I get that. But we've got to be very careful about just getting into this negative speech pattern. And sometimes it's the thing that destroys families. Sometimes in family systems, no one's talking with each other, but they're all talking about each other. And what's really bad is when that gets into the family of the church. 
And man, the Bible tells us if you have something about somebody or with somebody else, you have an issue, go to them. Do it privately. Do it confidentially. And if you don't have the cojones to go to them, then just shut up and pray for them. But don't go tell their stuff to someone else. Don't repost, don't click, and I want you to go through your social media profiles. And I want you to look at all the stuff that you've reposted, you've clicked it, you've commented on, how much of it is negative and involves someone else, even a famous person? How much of it is just negative speech? Do you really need to have that? It's time for us to clean up this out of our mouths. Amen. Because we need, to be the pe- we need to be the people who are the people of Jesus. Jesus knows the worst about all of us and doesn't share it with anybody. Amen? We need to, we need to be loyal and faithful. And by the way, I just want to say this. When someone in the family of God sins, someone in the house of the Lord falls into sin, sometimes, you know, young people can get into trouble. Sometimes... Sometimes folks uh, sin in ways where they they have an unexpected pregnancy or sometimes a a, a marriage, in spite of every best effort, doesn't survive. When we hear these things, it can be difficult for us to hear. But our job, once we've heard something that's true about someone else in the body of Christ, that's hurtful or negative or painful, our job is not to go and tell everybody else what we heard. Let someone else spread the rumor. Our job is to say, what, Lord, can we do to help the person? You know, I was part of a a, a particular branch of Christianity for a while that was, uh, had a very legalistic view of right and wrong. And, And the rules, the rights and the wrongs, I mean, most of it, they were right about. But if someone did something that was sinful or wrong, there would be the shaming that would happen. Sometimes they'd be called out from the pulpit. If a young person, God forbid, or maybe not even a young person, a person, you know, fell into some kind of a sin with somebody and maybe they got pregnant and they weren't married, there'd be this hell to pay. They'd be shamed. And they'd be put on the, in one church I knew of, they put people in the back row of the church for a number of years even if they got married afterwards because they had the stigma. You know, we say that we want life, we want women to choose life, and and we we don't want abortion, and we don't. But I'm going to say something. If a woman has a pregnancy that she didn't plan for, is unwanted, or even, God forbid, came out as a result of because of a, a mistake or a sinful behavior, then we're not helping if we shame the person who's fallen into sin or made a mistake If a person sins and we value life, then we need to affirm that life and say, okay, obviously this wasn't the ideal situation. And, you know, but let's find a way to help you make the choice. Let's, instead of making it difficult to be in the church and, and, to, and to live with the con, let's try to find a way to help a person through instead of shaming them. The place that ought to be safe for, for people who fall is the church. And we tend to be really tolerant when it's a sinner getting saved. But boy, if you're saved, you better not sin. The problem was that with that is that we all sin. And what happens is, I'm not saying go ahead and sin and there's no results. We talk, we're talking about sin today. But when we try to punish sin and believers, we shame people, and instead of it being a safe place for people to come and get help when they stumble, we have to hide now. We have to pretend. And I just want to say, in this church, I don't want you to sin. I don't want to sin. But we do. I do. And when we do, we need to come to church and know that it's a safe place to be real and we're not going to get condemned. If we are honest before God, God is going to forgive us and we're all going to be a part of helping restore one another, not shaming one another. 
And if I go to somebody in the church and I say, listen, I'm dealing with this, I'm struggling with this, I fell in this area, I, we, this ought to be the one place where somebody's going to say, listen, let me pray with you. This is between you, me, and Jesus. And they don't have to worry about it getting repeated to three or four other people. Is this all right today? How many would love to be a part of a church where people keep confidences and don't gossip? Then let's be that church. Let's be that church. All right, let's all stand up together. Father, we just thank you and praise you today for your word. We thank you, Lord, for helping us, teaching us. Lord, convict us of the words of our mouth. Father, when we're saying something, uh, Lord, that is, uh, that is unkind about someone else, slandering, Lord, or even gossip, Father, uh, let us judge our hearts before we repeat it. Lord, help us to use our mouth wisely and carefully. And Father, let us be a part of the ministry of Jesus, who is the advocate of sinners and not the ministry of Satan, who's the slanderer and the accuser of the brethren. And Father, as we learn to do these things, we thank you that we will grow up. And now when we speak and when we pray, mountains will move and heaven will answer. And we give you the glory and the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't miss next Sunday. We're going to start a new 40-day Lent devotional next Sunday. I'll be sharing it next Sunday. And we're going to walk towards great things in the Lord. Wednesday night deep dive. Hope to see you there. May the Lord bless and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Lift up his face upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name. God bless you. Have an awesome week. Wow, what a great message today. We trust that God is moving through this message to bless you and meet you right where you're at and to do dynamic things in your life. For this message and others just like it, you can subscribe to our YouTube page, you can download our free church app, or you can even subscribe to our podcast. And don't forget to follow us at alcclife.org to find out about all the incredible ways that you can connect with Abundant Life. We hope that you have a phenomenal week and we trust that God is doing great things.